Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox. I'd like to welcome you to episode 129 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Today I discuss the book review by Judge Rakoff in this month's issue of the New York Review of Books, the <coughs> denial of approval of the deferred prosecution agreement by Judge Richard Leon in the Fokker um, um, export control case and individual prosecutions under the FCPA. The episode comes in at just over uh, 16 minutes and I hope you find it interesting. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Uh, today I wanted to visit with, uh, with you about a couple of things that have come up this week from federal district judges. The first is a book review by Judge uh, Rakoff, Jed Rakoff, of the Southern District of New York. He reviewed the book, Too Big to Jail, How Prosecutors Compromise with Corporations. It appeared in this month's edition of the New York Review of Books. Uh, the second is comments by Judge Richard Leon, a federal district judge in the District of Columbia. And this was about a... Um, case before him, which was not an FCPA compliance case, but it was a case involving export control violations by a company uh, called Fokker, F-O-K-K-E-R, and uh, Judge uh, Leon uh, was presented with a DPA to sign uh, from Judge, uh, excuse me, from uh, the Department of Justice and Fokker for its export control violations, and he rejected it. So I wanted to talk about those two uh, uh, written opinions, although one is a book review, I suppose I should say, not a written opinion. Um, and then uh, also talk about the potential increase in individual prosecutions under the FCPA and what it all may mean. So let's start with uh, Judge Rakoff. And unfortunately, uh, Professor Garrett, uh, the author of the book, uh, his uh, Brandon Garrett, is a professor at uh, UVA uh, in uh, Charlottesville. Unfortunately, his book has not yet uh, been released, so I can't really uh, discuss the, um, the entire book, uh, but I will certainly uh, devote a, a podcast in the uh, upcoming uh, time frame of when I receive a copy of the book. I've ordered it from Amazon and uh, talk about it in some detail. But <clears throat> Judge Rakoff, uh, in his review, uh, details the history and approach of, uh, of uh, the Department of Justice uh, in the use of DPAs, the evolution, I should say, in the use of deferred prosecution agreements. Um, the book uh, details the uh, various memorandums uh, named for the uh, DOJ Deputy Attorney Generals in charge who, uh, uh, whose name they went out under. So we have the Thompson Memorandum, the McCallum Memorandum, and the McNulty Memorandum detailing the use of uh, deferred prosecution agreements going forward. And that uh, really the, uh, the, the crux of Judge Rakoff's review and indeed his criticisms of deferred prosecution agreements are using them to, um, or rather the DOJ's consideration of whether an effective compliance program is in place. And uh this is one of the factors that uh, prosecutors are supposed to take into account. And the proliferation of DPAs um, really began around 2007. Uh, and on the average, there are 35 DPAs um, uh, uh, entered into each year. And, and I should say that that figure includes non-prosecution agreements as well. And uh, Judge, excuse me, uh, Professor Garrett's book details how many corporations are uh, multi-time recidivist, even in the face of having a entered into a deferred prosecution agreement. So um, what Professor Garrett concludes is that uh, such agreements really fail to achieve meaningful structural or ethical reform within a corporation. And certainly one of Judge Rakoff's criticisms is that such agreements obscure who may have been personally responsible for the company's misconduct. 
Uh, interestingly, Professor Garrett does not urge the abandonment of uh, DPAs, and I think that's a step that Judge Rakoff certainly uh, would like to see going forward. But uh, <clears throat> Professor Garrett recommends that uh, steps be taken to improve their efficiency, efficacy, I should say, which would include uh, greater judicial oversight, greater use of court-appointed monitors, and greater attention to breaches of the agreement. So if you think about the FCPA world, or at least the DPA world, uh, we had uh, one, at least one, uh, we've had two DPAs where companies were recidivists. And the result, or the further penalty, uh, could not have been more uh, diametric. So we had Tyco, who entered into a DPA back in, uh, I believe, 2009, uh, Tyco engaged in uh, numerous instances of DPA, uh, excuse me, FCPA violations, but a wide range of other conduct for which the company was sanctioned. And a couple of years later, it turned out that uh, the conduct had con continued even in the face of the DPA. And the rather stunning thing was that there was no prosecution uh, the second time around. So many kind of scratched their heads as to why. Uh, one thing Tyco did was go out on the speaker circuit and really do a mea culpa, admitted the problems that uh, they had engaged in or problems that had arisen because of their conduct, but talked extensively about their remediation. And I think that uh, that really made a difference to the Department of Just Justice because you can contrast that with the Marabini uh, company. Marabini was an agent who was involved in the... Uh, Second largest FCPA fine in the history of the world ever, Halliburton KBR and the Nigerian uh, bribery scam scandal. Uh, Maravini was an agent, uh, paid a uh, relatively low fine in that case of $50 million, the lowest of any company and or individual, if you include the uh, profit disgorgement paid by the individuals. The... Um, uh, Marabini, however, um, didn't learn their lesson, and uh, it's unclear if they put a paper program in place or didn't, but they got caught up in the Alstom bribery scandal in Indonesia and were uh, required to pay a significant amount, I think $80 million the second time around. Uh, the Department of Justice stated in the settlement documents the complete, total, and utter lack of of having an effective compliance program and really pointed to the um, highest levels of the company for this failure. But even in the face of that conduct and really thumbing their nose at the DPA and the Department of Justice for their ongoing obligations, there were still no indiv individual prosecutions against Marabini employees. <clears throat> so the criticism that Judge Rakoff raises, citing to Professor Garrett's work on uh, DPAs. Uh, I believe the criticism has merit. It's certainly factually based. And uh, Judge Rakoff, unlike Professor Garrett, would uh, do away uh, with DPAs and have uh, criminal prosecutions against um, high-level company officials and uh, uh, require the government to either fish or cut bait and uh, go out and, and prosecute companies. Uh, Judge Rakoff, however, brings up an interesting point with his, he was he is really the first or only government commentator, if you can call a judge a, common, a government commentator, to talk about senior executives. I have previously written uh, in an article for uh, this month's issue of Compliance Week entitled you asked for it, now you have it, increased individual prosecutions under the FCPA, I cited to a speech that uh, Assistant Attorney General Leslie Caldwell gave in October to the 22nd Annual Ethics and Compliance Conference of the uh, CECOA. And uh, in this, she said that when, uh, and I quote, when criminal misconduct is discovered, a critical factor in the department's prosecutorial decision-making is the extent and nature of the company's cooperation. The department's principles of federal prosecution of business organizations provides that prosecutors should consider 
the corporation's timely and voluntary disclosure of wrongdoing and its witness to cooperate in the investigation of its agents. Now let me flesh out <clears throat> the often discussed but sometimes poorly understood concept of cooperation. But companies all too often tout what they view as strong cooperation while ignoring the prosecutors that prosecutors specifically consider the company's willingness to cooperate in the investigation of its agents. Corporations do not act but for the actions of individuals. And here I would note she's not Mitt Romney. But back to the quote, in all but a few, a few cases, in an individual or group of individuals is responsible for the corporation's criminal conduct. The prosecution of culpable individuals, including corporate executives, for their criminal wrongdoing continues to be a high priority for the department. Uh, for a company to receive cooperation credit following the self-report, and here's the money line, it must root out the misconduct and identify the individuals responsible, even if they are senior executives. So, uh, end quote. So here we have uh, Assistant Attorney General Caldwell <clears throat> talking about companies teeing up their own employees uh, to give to the, the Department of Justice to prosecute going forward. Uh, couple that with Judge Rakoff's uh, thoughts on which he's previously written about regarding deferred prosecution agreements and his <clears throat> points he raises in the book review in the New York Review of Books of Professor Garrett's work. So uh, pretty clearly I think that the uh, the wind may be shifting and we may see more employees being prosecuted individually. But will they really go after senior executives and will companies really work to tee up their senior executives? <clears throat> or will it be uh, just the regular rank and file? Uh, in the case of the New England Patriots and Deflate Gate, we have the infamous ball boy who uh, the, uh, certainly the Patriots blame for allegedly deflating balls. Uh, not having a systemic problem at all. So, or, or you know, perhaps even Colonel Mustard in the library uh, with a knife. Uh, who is going to uh, uh, be teed up by corporations uh, identified, uh, the individuals responsible to use uh, General, uh, excuse me, uh, Leslie Caldwell's phrase. So, how exactly is a company going to do this? Well, they obviously have to uh, do an internal investigation, but if they encounter conduct which might violate the FCPA, uh, what protections do employees have? Will corporations continue to provide counsel uh, to employees? Uh, will corporations uh, provide Miranda warnings? Can corporations, should corporations provide Miranda warnings? Uh, what about other pretrial or procedural uh, protections that are in place for criminal defendants or those that are even being investigated? If a company is engaging in a civil investigation for potential FCPA violations, does that uh, require things like a Miranda warning or things like the right to counsel? Um, those are open questions at this point. So, uh, but we do have uh, Leslie Caldwell on record. Uh, saying that companies need to, to work to tee up individuals uh, so the department can go after them. Uh, although played out in a little bit different scenario, think about the prosecution of former Petro Tiger co-CEO Joel Siegelman. Um, the Department of Justice uh, received or obtained a indictment and uh, agreement to plea by the company's former general counsel, Gregory Wiseman, after a uh, meeting with FBI agents, Mr. Wiseman, who is the company's general counsel, went and met with Mr. Siegelman specifically to discuss the alleged bribery payments made to the Colombian National uh, Energy Company by uh, Petro Tiger. Uh, it turned out that Mr. Siegelman uh, believed that uh, his general counsel was wired up and did not really seek any legal advice, only told him just to, to keep calm and carry on, basically. Uh, this tape was uh, to be introduced in evidence of Mr. Siegelman's uh, uh, trial. 
he sought to suppress it under the attorney-client privilege, but he, he forgot if he ever knew that the attorney-client privilege only applies to legal advice. It doesn't apply to chit-chat. Uh, it certainly doesn't apply to a criminal enterprise, and it doesn't apply where your lawyer asks, what should I do, and you say, carry on, have a cup of tea, uh, stiff upper lip, uh, all those British things that they do. So uh, Mr. Siegelman's motion to uh, suppress was denied. Uh, there's a lot of play about this in uh, the press, but it really, I think it's because they don't understand the nuances of the attorney-client privilege rule. So if you don't have a lawyer being asked a legal question, given legal advice, you probably don't have an attorney-client privilege. But that's how this might play out going forward, and I don't think uh, many companies have really thought through this. Certainly company employees haven't thought through it, and general counsel and compliance officers may not have thought through this. So um, very interesting development from Judge Rakoff, an interesting development that I have written about uh, from Leslie Caldwell. Obviously, there have been uh, many commentators, blog writers, uh, senators, and others criticized the Department of Justice for... Uh, not going after individuals, and I think we may see uh, the department moving in that direction. Let me just add a few words about the uh, Judge Leon and his refusal to approve a deferred prosecution agreement. I mentioned this was not in the FCPA context, but in export control, and we had a company who had uh, sent products to uh, various countries uh, prohibited uh, under U.S. trade uh, sanctions, uh, specifically including uh, Iran, uh, but also Sudan and Burma. And uh, uh, the resolution in addition to the DPA was a payment of $21 million. Uh, Judge uh, Leon found this specifically to be insufficient given the conduct of the company, given the profit that they made, uh, and their overall uh, lack of a uh, export compliance program going forward. Uh, there was no corporate monitorship. There was no um, reporting to the Department of Justice. Um, there appeared to be uh, inadequate sanctions and uh, very little uh, deterrence going forward. So uh, with Judge Leon taking a more active role, we may see the judiciary take a more active role when it comes to the deferred prosecution agree agreements. I don't know if this will satisfy the criticism that's been out there about DPAs. I don't know if this will satisfy the criticism of Judge Rakoff, but it's certainly a very public uh, display of judicial independence regarding a deferred prosecution agreement. And if a judge says, no, this is not enough, you're going to have to go to trial against some individuals, uh, that's certainly something that the Department of Justice has to, to pay attention to going forward. So some very interesting developments. Um, it's going to be, uh, we'll have to watch this very closely. Very interesting that uh, this came out in the same week. Uh, so uh, I don't know where this will go, but uh, it's going in a direction that I think uh, will be a big change for uh, FCPA enforcement. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, please shoot me an email at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. This is Tom Fox, and uh, thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report.